one of the things that that fascinated Darwin was the adaptation of one species to another so that they worked uh, to their mutual benefit. There were many, many examples of this, but one of the most famous is the star orchid. You may have seen the common tobacco plant shown in the upper right, uh, which is fertilized by a hummingbird moth that uh, sticks its tongue into the long, narrow channel to get the nectar. When Darwin found the star orchid uh, in Madagascar, shown on the left, he hypothesized that there was going to be a moth with a tongue long enough to reach down to the nectar at the bottom of the structure. Sure enough, uh, about 30 years later, uh, the moth was found and named the predicted moth. Orchids in general were very fascinating. So many of them looked like insects and very much like insects. Uh, in fact, some of them look so much like insects, typically female insects, that male insects attempt to mate with the flowers and in doing so pollinate the flowers by picking up the pollen and carrying it to another plant. This is one of the most remarkable adaptations that Darwin had ever seen. Not exactly an issue of cooperation, but rather similar was the ability of insects to mimic other species. For instance, the tiger swallowtail, a large yellow and black and very beautiful butterfly, in its first stages, shown in the upper right, looks like a small bit of a bird dropping. In its full-grown caterpillar stage, it lives in a curled leaf and has fake eye spots. Those are not really its eyes at all. Uh, that make it look very much like a snake. And it can even stick out uh, some orange, evil-smelling horns uh, that look a bit like a snake's tongue. Birds have been known to be poking around the leaves, and when they come across it, to leave in fright, uh, thinking that they have suddenly encountered a small snake. In other situations, you encounter something like this. A blue frog looks to you somewhat unnatural and even evil. And it is, in fact. When it, uh, This is a very toxic frog. And it is to the benefit of toxic animals to advertise that they are very dangerous and not to be fooled around with. And it is further an advantage to them if uh, toxic uh, coloration, or what's called aposomatic coloration, is common enough that if an animal knows one instance in which a brightly colored animal is toxic, it will fear other brightly colored animals. Thus, the monarch butterfly, shown in the picture, second picture from the top, and the lower right picture, uh, it grows by eating milkweed and incorporates the uh, strong toxicity of the milkweed. So it is a poisonous butterfly that can make an animal very, very sick. And it is brightly colored to warn other animals not to touch it. On the other hand, the viceroy butterfly, uh, shown at the top and at the left, is uh, colored almost identically to the monarch butterfly. It's not toxic at all. But after all, if you were a, a bird that had tried to eat a monarch and gotten very sick from it, would you consider touching the viceroy? No. And so the mimicry works very well. And again, this kind of thing arises as to how did it evolve. The closest cousins of the viceroy are much more dully colored, uh, rather purplish red butterflies. This type of mimicry is seen over and over again. So, for instance, the deadly coral snake of uh, southern United States and Central America uh, is rightly very brightly colored to warn off a poten uh, uh, potential predators from attempting to fool with it. On the other hand, the milk snake, shown in the lower right, uh, looks an awful lot like it. Now you can tell the difference if the patterning goes 
uh, red and yellow, that is yellow touches uh, the red, uh, it's red and yellow killifellow, that's a coral snake, where it's red and black, venom lack, that's a harmless milk snake. But I ask you, if you were walking in a field and you encountered uh, the snake, would you bother to ask uh, what the rule was before you t attempted to, before you decided to leave? No. So the mimicry is very effective indeed. So, which of these is the wasp that you would rather avoid in your picnic? They look a lot alike, don't they? But the yellow jacket in the center is the only one that has a sting. The cuckoo bee is completely harmless, and the one on the right is a fly, which even holds its legs to look like antennae, because flies don't have antennae. This and other adventures can be found in The Joy of Science by Richard A. Lockshin, published by Springer.